Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, today I'm surrounded by Yorkshiremen. Yeah, you are. Um, Phil Fraser, welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. Hi, guys. Nice to be on. And, you know, at the moment, um, we understand that you're not actually in God's county. You're actually over in Spain. What's going on? I am indeed. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to, uh, to have a, a place out here and uh, my daughter is a teacher, so it's half term. So we've, we're have we out here for a few days. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, but you're also a fellow Leeds United fan. So um, we're actually wearing black today. Anybody who watches the video, you'll be able to see. We're actually not watching, wearing black either of us. But the point is, last night we were properly gubbed by uh, Liverpool. But anyway, we'll, we'll move swiftly along um, because you actually are a um, like a business coach come business mentor. Um, but you have this idea of being a sounding board. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so um, a business sounding board is something um, I sort of a made up title that I made up. (laughs) And why not? It's a good way of standing out, being unique. Absolutely, I'm unique. I'm the only one in the whole world. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And a business sounding board is sort of halfway between a business coach and a business mentor. Um, I sit alongside um, SME business owners to be, as the name suggests, their sounding board. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And, you know, when you're running your own business, it's, it's often a case of, you know, it's lonely at the top. Uh, and my role is to avoid it being lonely at the top and to be there to discuss those big decisions that the SME business owners have to discuss. You know, it might be I've got a problem with a member of staff or it might be I've got a brilliant idea, but, I, you know, I just want to talk to somebody about it. Or I've got a big problem. I don't want to talk to somebody about it. Or it might be somebody's offered me a million pounds for the business. Shit. Should I take it? Should I not take it? What do I do? All of these sort of questions that all business owners get um, is, is, is very hard to decide and, and, and make a decision on, on your own. And very often there's nobody to do that with. And that's where I come in. So I sit alongside the business owner. I don't advise. I just bounce things around. And usually my role is just asking, is batting things back and asking questions. Yeah, it's a really annoying trait, that though, isn't it? Because you, you don't really help anybody. No, you do. Obviously, clearly you do. Yeah. And but I, um, I, I hate people that ask that difficult question that makes you think about things. Yeah, I mean, it'd, it'd make a pretty good podcaster, wouldn't it, really? It I would suppose. really, yeah. That yeah. curiosity. But it, it, actually, that's probably a good point, isn't it? You, you have to be a fairly curious person to actually help your clients. That's right. And, and actually, sometimes it helps. In fact, very much it helps not being in the business because you're looking from the outside in and that's always going to give you a a different perspective to the to the owner who's thinking, shit, where's next month's sales coming or 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 we've got a supplier that's gone bust or what you know, the 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 day-to-day minutiae. You've got somebody who's sitting there and the you know, there are there are two classic questions that you can always ask people, and that's you know, why do you do that? And why do you do it that way? And people hate that question because the answer is usually, um, oh, I did it like that in my old business, so that's the way we do it. Or we've always done it like that. And, and they are both terrible answers because in certain instances, they've just not considered any other options. And, and when you look from the outside in, it's obvious. It's like, that's bloody ridiculous. Why do you do that? And why do you do it that way? But you, they can't see it. Yeah. And presumably... That, that actually opens up the floodgates in terms of the opportunity to change it positively for them. Correct. Because, because they've never, they've either never asked themselves that question or they've never mm. been asked that question mm. or they've never needed to focus on that process or that system or that structure or even that strategy because it's the one that's in place and we'll just carry on. I mean, some, yeah, some of it's fear, some of it's ignorance and that's ignorance in, in the just not knowing sense, not bloody ignorant, um, or, or just not wanting to go there. Just like, you know, if, if it ain't broke, you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? And, and sometimes that's right, and, and sometimes that's not the right answer. Yeah, and that, that's something I'm seeing quite a bit in our business at the moment. We've, we've taken on a, a marketing person, and a lot of the marketing early, in the early days of Grow CFO was simply the, the, the two business founders kind of working out things and putting in what we knew best. And as two chartered accountants, it probably wasn't uh, 
all that clever. And some of those ideas have really, really been challenged. Now we've got we've got a marketing person working with us. It's and it it, it is quite amazing how that well it wasn't broken. So why are we fixing it? But actually, it was broken. <laughs> Yes. Yes. It was, it was probably broken, but you didn't know it's broken because you yeah. don't know any different. Exactly. And, and probably because we've always done it like that. And this is what always happens. But how do you, how do you know when to stop helping? Um, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's actually comes from the client side rather than my side. You know, one of the things I, I find, and it is really interesting, obviously to run your own business, you have to be a certain type of person an ego you've got a bit of drive about you and you've got to have a bit of oomph about it. and actually it it's sort of counterintuitive to that type of person to ask for advice from an outside person but that also works the other way so once they've asked enough advice they will then get to the point where they go, actually i don't need anymore so so my service and, and other coaches and other mentors will probably say their services stop when the client ceases well let's they cease to believe they need the support. You know, the, the coach, the mentor, me might think, actually, you need a bit more support. But they might go, well, you know, I'm, I've got enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that, that's what makes the decision, is, is the client's decision rather than me going, I can't help you anymore. It, it, it's a good answer because at the end of the day, um, the client's going to be in charge of, of the relationship. But, you know, you're, at, you're there as, a, as this sounding board. And I can see that, I can I can really appreciate it, and I'm sure Kevin can as well. But when you run your own business, you are a little bit on your own. And yes, you you, you go to other people. I'm me. I ask Kevin, um, and he, and he charges me every time I speak to him. But um, at the end of the day, and Graham but, charges me back every time I speak to him. And no, says, it's not true. Yorkshire with Scottish ancestry. You can yeah, tell well, it is. Well, that's true. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm not denying that I'm a bit tight. But the, but <laughs> having said that, um, the it's different from having somebody who's paid and done it and done it in lots of different industries like you have phil and so uh, getting to that decision that that i absolutely need a sounding board what are the kind of uh, worry signs that you you know that that somebody might want to recognize in themselves that says actually i need phil it's an interesting one because you know when you run your own business there are, there are certain external suppliers that you you must have you know you must have an accountant in certain instances, you will need a lawyer. In yeah. certain instances, you know, when you get bigger, you might need an, an HR executive or an HR manager or something like that. A business coach or business mentor or business sounding board is, is as I said, is sort of some, something self-selecting. Mm. And there are lots and lots of different reasons why people would do that. Uh, and you know, if I look at you know, maybe two or three of my most recent clients, I had one guy who had, had basically fallen out of love with his business because it had got so confusing for him. Mm. He, 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 you know, he had three or four different strands to the business and, and basically just got to the point where like, I hate them all. And actually what it needed was just a little bit of talking, a bit of unravelling and, and, and a little bit of strategy. Sure. And, he's, he's, and, and you know, his testimonial back to me at the end said, you've made me fall back in my businesses. And then on the other side, I had a client who had grown her business organically to the point where she actually hadn't realised she was the CEO of a sort of five million pound turnover business, and that is a different person, a different skill set to somebody who was a. You know, she was still thinking like a startup owner, mm. and and you can see, you know, you can see why that happens, and it's there's no finger pointing or anything. It's just at some point, you know, I had to sit down with her and go, look, you are the CEO of a five million pound turnover business. And some of the things she was doing were still very minutia based and still very startup based. Mm. And what I had to say to her was, you know, if you employed an MD and they were doing the things you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, what would you say? What the hell are you playing at doing that when you should be, you know, doing this? Mm. You needed somebody outside to tell her that. So sometimes the warning signs are there when people get to the point where they go, shit, I need somebody. Um, well, the other side of it is, you know, actually being aware of, of me and the service I offer is, is down to me sort of banging the drum and appearing on podcasts and, and, and that sort of thing, where people go, do you know what? I could, I could do with one of them. Yeah. 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 And 
Phil, I can I can really see this role in the, the business that I'm involved in, Grow CFO. One of the key key elements of our business is, is actually mentoring CFOs, mainly ones that have probably recently been appointed. And now it's the same thing. They're they're lonely because they're the guy with the the finance expertise in the business, but there's nobody else really to talk to about that. There's the, the, the CEO's got some silly ideas that might be challenging their ethics or stretching them a bit, and they've got nobody to talk to about it. And you know, they've been the head of finance, the financial controller. They've had all of this lower level knowledge. They passed their exams to get to that. No, CFO. And like your, your, your founder that suddenly became the CEO of a five million pound company. It's very different. It's a whole different skill set. So I can totally, totally see the role of you as the business sounding boards, Phil. And certainly taking somebody like you that definitely isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign of there's somewhere else we can go. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, hopefully I'm adding to people's skill set and I'm, um, you know, making them do their job better. I'm, I, in effect, I'm making business owners better business owners. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, often, and I've been there and I've done it and I've got the t-shirt, I've got the battle scars. And a lot of the time when you're running your own business, particularly as a startup and as you grow, it feels like you're making it up as you go along. And, and a lot yeah. A lot of the time you are. But you can't tell the team that. You can't tell the team, shit, guys, I'm not really sure what we're doing, but this feels like a good idea. Mm-hmm. But if you've got somebody on the outside to say that to and go, shit, fella, I really don't know what I'm doing, but this feels like a good idea. And you know, I'm the one who goes, do you know what? Go for it. That's a really good idea. That's fine. And it's a bit of reassurance. It's a bit of sense checking. And sometimes it's a bit of, whoa, you don't want to be doing that. It's you know, a kind of, it's a, combination of on your website you've got a number of kind of reasons that people would want to talk to you and one of them is guidance and the other one is accountability and that your answer there just seemed to sort of merge those two things together so you give guidance but you you'd also have that kind of thing you know little genie on his shoulder uh, or her shoulder and saying being actually you're making a good decision here or at least it's on all you know on all the sort of metrics and the way i look at it market all the rest of that it sounds like a good idea so you're not really responsible for the actions of that of that individual taking control, apart from the fact that they might turn around in a couple of months' time and say, "It won't. It won't about. It wasn't a good idea after all, Phil." Um, but it's it, the chances are the reason that people pick you is that you you said the battle scars. You've got you've got you know so much experience in a world where there's you know if you spit you hit a business coach. Um, in, what makes you stand out then? Um, I like that. I like that phrase. <laughs> um, I think what makes me stand out is the fact that I've been there and done it. You know, there are without naming names. You know, there are. You know, you can buy a franchise and be a business coach. You know, right. I've paid five thousand pounds. I'm now a business coach. Ta da! Yeah. Um, you can you can read a book. You can. Yeah. And go on courses. You can do ILM, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not dismissing any of that. Um, but until you've been in the firing line, until you've been in the coal face, it's very, very hard, I believe, to truly be able to advise somebody. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, I think I definitely yeah, agree somebody, with that. Somebody has a business problem. Hang on, let me just check chapter sixteen. What does it say? I have to do. <laughs> ah, yeah. Whereas, whereas I've probably been in a similar situation, and and, and although the answer from me isn't. You know, we did it like this, you have to do it like that. I can say, look, the issue you have, whether it's a good issue or a bad issue, I, you know, we had something similar. This is how it played out for us. How does that fit with where you are? And have you considered X or Y or Z? And they go, ah, right. Okay, so I'm not unique that, you know, insert problem X or, or opportunity Y. It's, yeah, everybody has that situation. And these sometimes what I'm doing is I'm just putting options out there. You, know, you could do X, you could do Y, you could do Z. And, and probably they've only seen one option and go, oh my God, we're stuck. This is all I can do. Yeah. You just need somebody to go, whoa, hang on a minute. You know, have you considered this? Oh, I never thought of that. Have you considered that? Well, that's quite a good idea. And have you seen that company X down the road have done similar? Oh, I never saw that. You know, it's, it's just bringing all that stuff 
into the pot. Yeah. That I, I can really, really see the value of that, Phil. I mean, yeah. when we're mentoring CFOs, we've got a similar approach that all of our mentors have had to have done the CFO role themselves. They've had to have been there, done it, got the T-shirt, just as you say. So, so Phil, take me back a little bit and tell me about the experience that you are bringing to the table. How did you get to this position of been there, done that, got the T-shirt? Okay, so I had um, I had a varied varied career before I launched the business. So I, my background, well, I came out of university not knowing what I wanted to do. I did a year as a trainee accountant and absolutely hated it. Um, I can understand then, that. I hated it too. That's why I'm not doing accountancy do anymore. <laughs> um, but that did give me a you know, basic understanding of P&L and balance sheets and stuff, double entry bookkeeping and all that sort of stuff. Um, I then spent six or seven years selling advertising space in magazines and newspapers and, and latterly yellow pages. I then crossed crossed over to working ad agencies, so I learned all about advertising and marketing and all that sort of stuff, and then eventually ended up um, with William Hill, where I was responsible for launching their first ever online casino. This was back in 2000. While I was at William Hill, we came across the concept of online bingo. Long story short, I ended up um, with an online bingo comparison website, so the trip advisor of online bingo, um, which we ran for 18 years. We started just myself, my wife, kitchen table at home, zero investment, all the way through 18 years later to um, a sale to a PLC uh, in a multi-million pound deal. So... Yeah, quite a broad range of experience, but actually running a business, I've gone from, you know, zero pounds in the bank startup all the way through and everything that goes with that, you know, it doesn't go in a straight line like that. You know, there are peaks and troughs and and things fall apart. You know, we lost 80% of our business overnight in 2005 when the American market disappeared. And, you know, so there there are, you know, it's not a straight line. And... You know, the fact that it was in online is irrelevant. You know, I've got clients or had clients who are land-based and in markets I know nothing about. But it's still, as you know, I said previously, it's still the same issue. It's still eggs on board. Isn't yeah. one of the benefits of being a, a, um, a coach and or a mentor is that you can take a great strategy in, 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 in sector or industry one and actually apply it in a, in in a different sector uh, that doesn't usually observe that that as a strategy certainly in a marketing sense and it seems to me that that that's one of the strengths that you would naturally bring but you might not necessarily observe in yourself or do you um i think it, it a lot of it is is and and it's almost i'm embarrassed to do it but it, it, a lot of it is very very basic stuff right. none of it is is reinventing the wheel and and, and you know, Kevin, you'll find you know you're advising FDs on pretty obviously it's it's senior stuff, but it's still all all fairly bog standard stuff. And you know, in some times you think, bloody hell, how come you don't know this? But that's the benefit of, of outside influence is mm. you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And yeah. and you know, like you said, if 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 you've seen an experience in one sector and think, oh, that was fun. Why don't you overlay on this sector? And, and often, you know, oh, we don't do it like that in our sector. There's, you know, there's a huge benefit because that person may only have lived and worked in that sector. So they've only seen what's normal in that sector. And then what's normal in another sector, you, you bring that in. And you go, oh, that's brilliant. You go, well, actually, it's not. It's pretty basic. <laughs> but it's all standard stuff, you know. Yeah. And it's standard stuff, Phil. But, and- one of the commonest things that, that we see in our business is that folk have got lack of confidence and suffer hugely from imposter syndrome. Is that something that you find is, is, is one of the biggest things you've got to get past? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and again, particularly in startups, um, you know, you start a business, you're shit, I don't know what I'm doing, and then imposter syndrome kicks in. And interesting, it's funny you should mention that. I did an interview, or I interviewed the UK's expert on imposter syndrome last week, a lady by the name of Claire Yosa. And she was fantastic about what is imposter syndrome, what isn't imposter syndrome, how you get over it, and all that sort of stuff. 
Um, and it's it, imposter syndrome is really the gap between your skill set and what you believe you where you believe you should be. Mm. And a lot of these coping mechanisms that people preach just don't work because as that gap gets bigger, your coping what you call the coping bridge collapses because it doesn't you know, all that sort of fake it till you make it and pack stuff up back and all sorts of some of it just doesn't work. Um, but yes, a lot of clients suffer from that. But I did as well. You know, I because I felt most of the time we were making up as we were going like oh, shit. I better sell the company quick before somebody finds out I don't know what I'm doing. And I even, back in the day, um, ended up as a, I applied for a job as a, a, as a European marketing director position. And I got to the last two and actually pulled out of it because I thought if I get the job and find me out, I don't know at all. And that's classic. That's classic mm. imposter yeah. syndrome. Mm. Um, and, you know, real imposter syndrome isn't, oh, this is a bit scary. Real imposter syndrome is, is actually self-damage. It's like, I'm not going to take that opportunity because I can't. I'm going to turn that client down because we're not good enough to service them. That's real imposter syndrome. You know, I shouldn't be here. I don't. I, I shouldn't be in life for that promotion. As opposed to, oh, this is new and it's a bit scary. That's not imposter syndrome. Mm. You should get. You should get Claire on your podcast. She's brilliant. Absolutely. Mm, you may well do. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 it seems to me that you, you cover such a, a range of, of, of topics for, for people. So the entry points to you and your business is, um, it, could, it could come from any, anywhere, but, but your answer to most of these people will always be, yep, I can help you. Um, do you ever t- turn people down thinking, no, nah, actually, you know, you, you, you support Man United, or there's another, there's another reason why you're going to turn them down? I think supporting Man United is a good enough reason to turn. Well, no, I agree with that. But but having said that, is there a, is there a business that. reason? <laughs> I, mean, um, I think sometimes um, I will talk to clients or talk to potential clients, and they'll say they're not ready for, me. and and I will often feel that they're not ready for. Me. You know, there is a there is a stage between startup and. I would position it around six or seven staff, five, six or seven staff, where actually I think you've got to leave people to work it out themselves because actually me coming along helping might might lose them that opportunity where you go, do you know, I'm going to try this and see if it works. I'm going to try that and see if it works. Whereas once you get to sort of five, six, seven staff, you're starting to, you're starting to have to bring in new, new skill sets. So management, motivation, setting targets, or all those sort of, grown up things that maybe are actually actually are a different skill set to being that motivator that startup or this burning idea and people are going to help me and and particularly in very early days of startup when you do everything so so probably i would turn people turn people down at the, the the smaller end i think my imposter syndrome would probably make me run a mile if some plc ceo came along and said phil can you help me I don't. But, know about, I don't know about that. I, th- I, th- I think but, you, you, you no, no, ring no, no. and say, "No, I'm going to have that's, that's within me. That's not me. Yeah. But realistically, they're all the same problems as somebody who's got yeah. half a dozen or a dozen staff. So actually, that's that's the imposter syndrome in me saying, "Yeah. Oh my okay. God, I'm, I'm working with a CEO for a PLC. It's yeah. just you know, it's still, yeah, you know, a business owner with the same business issues. They've just got you know, a couple more zeros on the end of the numbers. That's all." Mm. Yeah, and and it, culturally, they'll be different as well. I mean, you know, Kevin and I are working in smaller businesses, but, you know, the end of the day, um, I think I've been talking potentially to a coach and I'm, and I'm thinking I'm not so sure at this stage whether or not it's, you know, it's almost like give me a, give me a place to, to breathe. But every now and again, I'm thinking I really do need a bit of help. Yeah. So it's, so it, even though it's, it's kind of, I'm I'm still coming to terms with is this the good a good decision? What would make um, for anybody that you deal with? What would make it a good decision? Is it, is there a return on investment promises? Or some how how do you go about pricing in your return on investment? Yeah, uh, this is a, this is actually a difficult one because I'm not putting a strategy in place. I'm not you know restructuring the supply chain. I'm not you know giving real hard on the ground advice. What I'm doing is advising the business owner 
Mm-hmm. Then they then make the decision as to which bit of it to take on board and, and which they feel is right or wrong, or whatever. And and without sort of ducking out of it, it's not up to me whether I make a difference. Oh, well, obviously I should be making a difference on the bottom line, but it's not directly. I'm not directly a, a bottom line targeted thing. Yeah. Um, so again, going back to one of the answers I gave before, a lot of this comes from the person, the business owner, that they feel yeah. they need what I'm offering. Now, one of the things I do offer is I offer a full money back guarantee on anything I do with people. So if we, if we come to the end of, of, you know, usually minimum is three months, we'll go longer if, ne- if needed. Um, if we get to three months and they think, I have not had any value from this at all, I'll give them the money back. No questions asked, no issue whatsoever. Yeah. Um, on the basis that if they don't think they've had value, then I've that's down to me, not down to them. Um, if they feel, you know, what I've advised them or what I've been doing with them is a waste of time, that again, that's on me, not on them. Now I could point the finger, but I'm not going to. It's look, it's there is a leap of faith. And going back to what I was saying before about business owners, you know, they've held their hand up and they. They've said, yeah, you know, I need some help. If yeah. I then offer my service and I am not helping them, then mm. I've, you know, I mean, there are, there are clients, and I've got an example, who actually wasn't a paid client, um, who I did some work with, did some advice with, put together some ideas for him, took them to him, and he didn't do anything with it. Now, that's, that's up to him. And, and some people just don't want or don't feel they need the help and advice. Now that was an unpaid client, um, but it did open my eyes to this point of, yeah, you know, we talk about who's your, who's your who's your ideal client, and actually, my ideal client, or, or who's my target audience, my audience are self-selecting. You know, they will only come to me if they feel they need or they want me. I'm not something where they're obliged. You know, again, pointing fingers at accountants, but we all have to have a really accountant. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a sort of a, it's one of those pain points, you'll have to have one. Um, but a business coach or a business mentor or a business animal, you don't have to. It's self-selecting. And, and the, the range, the, 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 the range of prices um, uh, for, uh, I'm, I'm going to say similar services, but I, I'm really conscious that yours is not necessarily similar to other people's that, we, that I'm aware of. How would you price for a sort of a small, medium-sized business um, in terms of, you know, that monthly fee? Is it a monthly fee of a s- several thousand? Or how does it work? Well, I, I, one of the things I wanted to do in, immediately when I sort of set myself up as this business was, a, was to avoid an hourly rate. Yeah. Because, uh, and, and it's uh, it, to a degree similar to things like, uh, it's, it's any service really, uh, accountants and lawyers and all that sort of thing. You're not paying for the hour I'm sitting in front of you. You're paying for the other four, 35 years of experience that I've got. So actually, if we divide any number by 35 years, it comes out really, really cheap. Um, so I, what, I, what I do is I charge a package fee. So it's, and it, it depends on frequency and, and you know, do you want a weekly meeting, a monthly meeting, a fortnightly meeting, whatever it might be, whether it be over a, yeah, and I prefer to do a minimum of two months, ideally a minimum of three months, because you can't do a great deal mm. in, in two months, six weeks, whatever it might be. And I say that's the price, and it's all paid up front. Yeah. So the, the money thing is completely out the window. Yeah. And what I say to people, you know, nominally meetings will be you know an hour or an hour and a half, whatever it might be, but it's as long as a client wants. So it's not. Okay. And that so typical fee in the middle there, Phil. The t- typical fee would be roughly. Give us an idea, then we know. So I, 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 I don't know whether you're whether you're like Premier League or, or, or Conference. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sure um, you're Premier League, of course. So if you did, for example, if we did say six sessions, which would be over three months, so it might be a monthly face to face and a, a sort of fortnightly phone call. Yeah, we're looking somewhere around four thousand pounds, maybe four and a half thousand pounds, something like that. Right. And this is why. Yeah. I avoid the hourly thing because you go. Know, Bloody hell, that works out at you know, whatever the figure might yeah, be yeah. per hour. Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't want to be in that situation. No. And also, making it prepaid, 
It's discussed once, it's gone. I, we get to the end of it, you want your money back, here's your money back. So I'm not yeah. chasing anybody for money. They're yeah. not thinking, yeah. oh, that session, cost, that session cost me 750 quid or something. It's not. You, no. it, it's a value-based thing. Yeah, I'm minded of the story of uh, the guy who had a, a piece of plant that wasn't quite working properly, calls the engineer out, engineer comes along and gets his hammer out and bangs the pipe. And suddenly everything's working properly. Presents his bill, £1,000. Well, £1,000, you're going to be here five minutes. Well, yeah. Okay, I'll itemise the bill. Banging the pipe with the hammer, £5. Knowing where to bang the pipe, £995. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. I, I, it and, and forgive me for prying in that area, but I think it, it's important because when, when somebody's considering you, it's, it's a factor, that's all. Um, yeah. But they, I mean, they've got to know and like you. And, you know, uh, and, and then the trust will come presumably at a point where you've actually served them in some way or other. Mm. Do you give them a sort of a, a bit of a heads up um, session where you're sort of like having that initial chat or do you almost like say, no, I can't, I can't and, and, until I'm on the clock like a lawyer, um, you know, um, you get a note out on me? No, I, I do it the other way around. So I will sit down with a client and we will talk about their situation, you know, what the current issues are, what they, you know, what they want from me, where they see me fitting in, all that sort of stuff. Um, I did one on what day is the day? Tuesday morning. Sat yeah. down with a sat down with a um, potential client. Uh, I think we were there an hour and a half. We talked all sorts of different things. Yeah. Um, and if she takes some value out of that and doesn't take me on as a client, I have no problem with that whatsoever. And in fact, I had, I had a potential client. 18 months ago we did that with a long very very long conversation mm -hmm. he came back and said well actually i'm not i'm not ready yet but you know what's what's the cost for the you know, time we did no cost at all because yeah. they've got to like me and and you know you talk about no like trust you know this is somebody who's running a business you know yeah. i don't know 200 300 half a million a million pounds worth of turnover yeah and they've got to know that they can trust me yeah. with you know their innermost secrets from the business. You know, this yeah. bit of the business doesn't work. Can you help me? Or I've got this brilliant idea that could turn us into a multi-million pound business. What do you think? You know, mm. they've got it. The no like trust is the important thing. And this is where things like podcasts like this work because they can hear me, they can see me. They go, oh, yeah, they and I like, absolutely. I like because of his gym. Um, but conversely, the other people are going, you know, he's a snake oil salesman. And that's, fair, that, and that's absolutely fine. I've got no, no I problem with that whatsoever. I haven't really picked that up um, about you, but um, as you yeah, said it. I'm no, saying I mean, some it, people might. Yeah. Yeah. If the cap fits, and I, I can't I, say. I, I get completely where you're coming from. And aside from this, I, I run a, another podcast around the gross CFO business. And we've, we've got half a dozen or so mentors. And I've recorded at least one podcast with every one of them. And it's all about... Just what you said. It's about introducing them, giving a giving anybody who's a potential mentee a feel for that person, because the 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 one thing making a decision that says I think I need a business coach or I think I need a mentor. There's then a second one that says, oh, and what sort of coach or mentor do I want? What what do I want to get from this? And even when you've answered that question, there's then another one that says. Is there a chemistry here? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And and I actually, I actually wrote an article a few months ago. Actually, you know, what's the difference in a business coach and a business mentor? And you know, various different things. But the key question, the key question, always has to be, what is, what do you want? What are you trying to get out of this? And that will then start determining whether whether it's a coach or whether it's a mentor or whether it's a sounding board. And you, you, the final point is absolutely right. It's a chemistry thing. You know, and and I talk a lot about niching, mm. and you know, niching is count is, to a lot of people is counterintuitive mm. because if you really really re niche, you start leaving money on the table, and the ultimate position to be in a niche is to be in a short list of one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and somebody used the somebody used the example to me of um, personal trainer who specialises in post pregnancy women. Okay. Now, he's not doing anything particularly specialist 
with those women is, is probably the same. Obviously, there'll be, there'll be certain, for medical reasons, certain bits of what we're doing that aren't the same. But he's a personal trainer. He could train anybody. But actually, if you are post-maternal woman and want a personal trainer, yeah. he's the one you'll go to. So he's on a short list of one, as opposed to, I need a personal trainer, is 30 of them. Um, yeah. Now, I've not niched that far down, but you know there are only going to be a certain amount of people or a certain type of person who needs a business anyway. Yeah, I, part of it's about being able to talk to a specific audience about their pain. So in the case of your personal trainer, he's talking directly to those new mums about the problems they're going through. And it's a very, very direct and specific conversation about that pain point. Yes, but he could he could train you or I. But actually, if we approached him and said, could you train us? He, if he was doing it, if he was niching properly, he'd say, no, he's leaving money on the table. Yeah. And, you know, it goes back to the question you asked me previously about, um, you know, is there anybody you'd turn down? Probably yes, because they're not right for what I'm trying to do and probably won't get the maximum out of my service. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, um, one of the things that I've noticed from your website, which is Phil, um, P-H-I-L, Fraser with an S, dot co dot UK, um, what your clients are saying about, and, and I notice there's a number of solicitors um, and some marketers, um, and it, it, I noticed the word met Phil at a, a networking event. I wonder how many times you meet people because you're just a, a you know a nice bloke and you you're chatting away to people at networking events um, versus those people who've sought you out. I mean, is there a sort of a, an instinctive split there? I mean. It, is it 50-50 or is it majority of people have sought you out? I think, particularly at the moment, because, I mean, I've only really been doing this for about 18 months. At oh, the moment, no. it's people who have come across me yeah. by the nature of my marketing. And that yeah. marketing has been, has been via the website, via LinkedIn, um, networking and podcasts. So... Yeah. A lot of it at the moment is very much, oh, I didn't realise I needed one of those, or that sounds like a good idea. Rather, so, they're, so they're finding out about me and my service and going, oh, that sounds interesting. I, I want that service, rather than actually going back to square one and sitting in their office and thinking, shit, I need a business sounding board. Let me see if I can find one. Let me see if I can find one online. It doesn't work like that, or it hasn't so far. Is it? If you had to really boil down your uniqueness to a, either a singular skill or idea or a or thing about you, or maybe not a singular, but a couple of things, what what would they be? Well, that's, that's tough, though, isn't it? Because you know, I mean, nice you've come to the like next that. 100 Days podcast. I mean, we, yeah. we, we fry <laughs> guests. But um, <laughs> I think um, it would. I think it would probably be a, a, you know, a lot of people um, highlight my my approachability. Um, I'm well. I hope I'm not some sort of really big bollocks and no. stomping around saying, "Hey, I can fix all your problems." I'm just sitting there going, "Look, I've run a business. We did pretty well. We sold for a decent amount of money." You're running a business. You're probably going to go along the same sort of path I've been on. Yeah. I'm a little bit further down the line than you are at the moment. If you want some help, I'm here. I'm happy to have a chat. That, that's probably my sell, which probably isn't as hard a sell as it should be, but that's no, no, that's but sort of me. You, you could. Co- I mean, other people have talked about being authentic, and, and and I know that's sometimes it becomes a hackneyed thing. But when you actually uh, boil that down, what you've just said is you're you're approachable you're not you're not too you know whatever up yourself and and effectively what you what you you know you can be trusted your advice can be trusted because hey a bunch of other people have taken that advice and they all say he gives good advice and he gets us through roadblocks all that kind of stuff is what they're actually saying about you so i just wondered whether 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 it was the sort of like we talked earlier uh, perhaps off air but it was um we talked about joe rogan and his his innate curiosity and i think that's one of the things that separates him as a podcaster 
And and that's one of the things that we, Kevin and I, we are, we, we've done this for six and a half years because we are truly curious about people. And 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 because actually in some ways, Phil, it makes us better. Now, I know that Kevin talks about grow CFO and, you know, I've got a grow CFO, but bingo going on. I, I'm, I'm ahead. You know, I, if, he's, <laughs> if he mentions it more than once. So the, the, the truth of it is, is that, you do have, it's obvious to me that you do have a very much a likability factor. Um, and, but it, it would seem to me that a lot of your business clients, are they quite local to West Yorkshire? Um, it has been, it has been to date, um, just by the nature of who I've been networking with and where I've been putting myself yeah. out. Yeah. Um, previous client was down in Tunbridge Wells, but a client in York, a client down the road. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it, it is geographically agnostic because obviously mm. we can do things like this. Yeah. Um, but it's it's again it's that trust. You talk we talk about trust a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think until somebody meets me, it's very hard. I mean, I haven't yet acquired a client purely online who I've never met, I've never spoken to, anything like that. I've never heard of it. Right. I want to book you straight away. Um, so there is that nature of the, you know you start locally and you. Spread out, um, but just wanted to just touch back on on the, the point you made about questions and stuff like that. Mm. One of the reasons I enjoy doing what I'm doing is, is I'm the sort of person. If you you know if you're on a, a plane or a train or, or sitting by the pool and you speak to somebody, oh you know what, what game are you in? Yeah, and um, and they'll say, oh you know I make pencils, and most people will go. Oh, I'd be like, oh wow, that's really interesting. How how do you get into that? How's the market work? How's the flight supply chain work? You know, where do you find your clients? I actually love talking to people about their businesses. So just doing what I'm doing, I enjoy doing it anyway. So even if I have an hour and a half with somebody and and you know they don't become a client, I've found out all about pencil industry or whatever it might be. And that's great. I love it. You know, I read a lot yeah. of business books and all you know sort of autobiographies and stuff like business autobiography and stuff like. That. I like business. Yeah, I, I, you have come across a little bit as a, as, a, as a pencil manufacturer today, but I don't worry too much about that. Uh, you've come across in a really well, uh, well-meaning pencil, way. If you see any pencil industry opportunities in, you know, in your day-to-day -day stuff, just find a moment to make it. <laughs> you, you know the man. Brilliant. Um, oh, Phil, you've been an absolutely brilliant guest. Um, it, it's make, it makes it even better for me that the, the fact that you, you're going through the same pain. And we, I don't know, we're probably not too far apart in terms of age. We've, we've seen the pain for many, many years. And, um, but I, I have to say, um, you've been a great guest today on the Next 100 Days podcast. So, Graham, really interesting to think about that whole subject of coaching and mentoring. And I think it's something that an awful lot of people can benefit from. Uh, not a sign of weakness, but a sign that there's a lot to learn from somebody who's been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Yeah, the notion of being a sounding board is, is, um, is quite clever, really, because I think yeah. that's actually what most people want, isn't it? I mean, they, you, you, you know, come out with these you know, fancy phrases being a business coach or a business mentor and you know i mean who cares what the difference is and it's a cigarette paper between the but between both of them and i know it isn't but the point is who cares actually what you want is somebody to listen to to the to the issues that you've got and actually have somebody yeah. bring out those issues that you might not actually think you've got but you do have so i i think um um uh, phil opened certainly my eyes to the sorts of things that um that, that he can help with. Um, and, you know, if you want to find him again, I'll just restate his website, which is philfraser.co.uk and it's uh, P-H-I-L, Fraser with an S, and um, uh, you'll be able to find Phil there. Or I think he lurks in uh, LinkedIn as well, so you might be able to get him there. I think that's where we came across him, actually, Graham. Mm. So, but, you know, I'd, I'd say if you think you want a coach or a mentor, you know, the process of Finding the right one, I'd definitely say look for somebody who has been there and done that and got the T-shirt. And yeah. mm. both in general business, the way Phil's operating, and we're mentoring CFOs, I mentioned during the show. Mm -hmm. It's all about that experience. And it's not somebody who'll come along and tell you how to do it, but it's somebody who can draw out from experience 
and derived from you those three or four different ways of doing things that you haven't thought about, talk you through them so you can make the decision. And the most important thing is, is the chemistry right? Yeah, and you, you have to be able to trust the person because otherwise, why yeah. would you take their advice? Yeah. Um, so I, it's it's very important that that happens. So, um, you know, another great podcast. And um, I'm uh, glad that Phil be, was able to draw, join us from his um, uh, daughter's uh, property over in Spain. Uh, and what a lovely uh, time he's having of it. Um, so today I've been Graham Arrowsmith. I've been Kevin Appleby. Goodbye. Goodbye.